365 days a year, the angels surround the throne of God, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. And if you're thinking that worship, this worship song lasted just a little too long, you're going to be disappointed in heaven. I'm not saying that as a rebuke. I'm just saying many times we were used to singing many songs and this was a this was a, a beautiful worship experience where the presence of the Lord hovered over this. And we weren't we weren't singing a song. We were making declarations in the spirit that he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. And he's light in the darkness. Those are declarations that we made over each other, over ourselves, over our region, and ultimately over the world. And so I want to encourage you, maybe if you're struggling with with that this was kind of a long song, I just want to encourage you that these were declarations that we were making for our healing, for our emotional health, for our physical health, for our our mindset, for our relationships, for everything in our life. We were just making declarations over that, that He will make a way, that He will do a miracle in our lives, in our situations. So Father, we're just so grateful You've given us an outlet for our pain and our suffering and for our tribulation. You've given us an outlet to worship you and to declare things that are true so that we will not get bogged down in our suffering, we will not get bogged down in the tribulation, persecution, but that, Father, we will see it as something that we endure with a grateful heart, knowing that you always have a purpose in our suffering, in our tribulation, in our persecution. And that is that we would see that you are Lord and that the world would watch us in this suffering and know that you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, and the light in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I'm just going to read these. I just want to talk to you today a little bit about our suffering, its purpose, and the ultimate outcome of our suffering here on earth as well as in eternity. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we do not want to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, when which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Amen? God comforts us in all of our affliction.
during the affliction, as well as hopefully after the affliction. He comforts us in all of our affliction. He doesn't always take away our affliction. but uses it to produce endurance within us. So in other words, suffering can coexist with our comfort. There is a place where we can come to. We have to have a teachable spirit. We have to have a God's eye perspective on life. But there is a place where our suffering can coexist with our comfort. I have been in situations where I've been in incredible pain because of a malady, uh, sickness, and, and uh, there have been times when I took no comfort during that affliction. But then there were times when I did take comfort in that affliction knowing that there was a spiritual battle going on as well as a physical battle. And every time that I, I treated this as, as a, uh, a, 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 a this, the sickness and pain uh, towards a purpose of me growing and becoming patient and enduring and, and becoming mature, I saw fruit from that suffering. And those times when I did not, take comfort during the pain, God was faithful anyway. And after I, rather than endure, after I moaned and groaned about the pain, and then, and then when the sickness was over, and I realized that I had made a mistake, and instead of complaining about something that God was going to use toward my good, I realized that, that, that this could also be used to bring me into maturity. And when I realized that, he was faithful. So for God to be faithful, we have to have faith in his faithfulness. Does that make sense? For God to be faithful, we have to have faith in his faithfulness. If we are, if we have a grumbling spirit, a complaining spirit, there's no faith in that. And I'm not saying that every single time this works this way, but in my life, those times when I came at my suffering in a spirit of uh, complaining and grumbling, I had no comfort. But those times when I did, look at this problem as something that's going to make me better, it's going to grow me, it's going to make me more mature. I took comfort during the pain and the outcome was spiritual growth. I think about, I think about you know, there, there, there's some incredible artwork, artwork out there uh, in statues that depict certain things. And you've, got, uh, you've got David, the statue of David. You've got uh, many other uh, statues that are depicting, um, you know, uh, spiritual people or spiritual experiences. And I just think about those statues are a representation of my life in that there were times when um, I needed a chisel and a hammer to knock something off of me. I remember when I was a kid, uh, 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 someone, it was a family member, not my parents, it was a family member who said uh, to me one day, you know, if you, don't, if you don't take care of that chip on your shoulder, I'm going to knock it off for you. <laughs> and uh, uh, my aunt was a disciplinarian, I'm telling you. And, uh, and she sometimes, uh, rather than... Uh, Rather than comfort us during our our, our troubling times, she just told the truth. <laughs> and
And basically, she said, if you don't get that chip off your shoulder, I'm going to knock it off for you because I'm not putting up with that, especially when you're at my house. And she treated me like a mother. She was my mom's sister, and, and uh, I loved her. But I learned something from that time, and that was is that if I've got a chip on my shoulder, if I've got a crum- grumbling and complaining spirit going on within me, I need a chisel and a hammer that God has. And uh, there are times when I'm teachable and the experience, while it's painful, I see the good that's going to come. I have faith in His faithfulness. And those times when I'm like begrudgingly going, okay, knock it off me, Lord. And I'm like stressing and straining and, and oh, I'm just so rigid. And it's so much more painful when He knocks that chip off your shoulder. So the, 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 the enduring that he's talking about in our suffering is that we cooperate with the chiseling. We cooperate with him knocking that chip off of our shoulder. We get rid of that grumbling, complaining spirit. And we begin to rejoice in the fact that whether we are healed or not, whether we are uh, the pain is taken away or not, we are going to agree with him that he is good and that everything he does or everything that happens to us, he will turn it to our good. That is a weird way of thinking in the world. But it's the standard in the kingdom of God. In fact, you could say that a paraphrase of that is No pain, no gain. (laughs) And you know, I remember the first time I heard that was uh, back in the 80s. I was living in Houston, Texas, and I got this wild idea that I needed to join uh, a fitness gym and I needed to get in shape. And so first, I, I paid my money and then they scheduled a trainer with me and I came in for my first appointment and he showed me the whole regime that I was going to have to do, and he made me do 100% of it the first day. And I went home exhausted, but thought, oh, that wasn't too bad. Well, the second day, it hurt a little bit more. Those muscles that hadn't been used hurt. By the third day, I was like, somebody got to take me to the ER. This just isn't right. (laughs) And I got to tell you, it uh, it took another two or three days for that pain to go away, but you know what? I was scheduled on the, on the third or fourth day to go back for more. And so I walked into the gym and I'm like, could you be a little easier on me this time? I'm still hurting from the first time. And that's where I first heard the phrase, or understood the phrase, no pain, no gain. And that is just, that, that, that no pain, no gain uh, principle was stolen from the kingdom of God. Is there pain in the kingdom? There sure is pain in the kingdom. But God turns all things to the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And so the pain has a purpose, and it's to get us to our destiny in Christ. When He's knocking chips off our shoulder... It is to conform us to the image of Christ. So if we have chips on our shoulder, we've got to understand those chips are not Christ. They're things that have to be knocked off so we can be conformed to the image of Christ. So suffering and affliction is not inherently negative. It feels like it. But God's not concerned with how we feel sometimes. He's concerned that we understand the truth and know that just because it feels good doesn't mean we should do it. And just because it feels bad doesn't mean that it can't lead to some reward. The the word comfort means a calling to one's aid. Encouragement. Consolation. And then a little later in the definition it says this, and when I saw this I thought, 
That just doesn't seem to fit. Till I begin to let the Holy Spirit speak to me. The word comfort also means to become a legal advocate. An advocate is someone who supports and fights for someone else. So when you go to the courtroom and you hire a lawyer, your lawyer is your advocate. He knows the law. He knows the system, the legal system, and his job is to be your advocate so that his win is your win, his, uh, your loss, I mean, your win is his win, your loss is his loss. He's actually your representative in court. And that principle, that legal principle, is borrowed or stolen from the kingdom. Because the Bible says that Jesus is our advocate. He is representing us in a, in a legal fashion in the throne room, in the courtroom of God. So him being our representative means when Jesus shows up, he stands between you and the judge, so all the judge sees is Jesus. He doesn't see me in all of my, uh, in all of my um, sin and all of my, uh, you know, mental uh, stress and strain and and all of my mental stupidity. <laughs> All that he sees is Jesus because he's my advocate. He's the one representing me in, in that throne room and in that courtroom. James 2, 2 through 4 says, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Who doesn't want to be mature, complete, and lacking nothing? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to know if that's what you really want. I'm just telling you, none of us really wants that. We want to be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. We want to have the fullness of God. That's what I taught on last week. We want the fullness of God within us. And obviously, um, that fullness uh, is something that builds and grows in us. And it doesn't end when we die. It actually transfers into that next phase of life, which is eternity. For our own good. Maturity, fullness, spiritual leadership, and abundant provision from the Lord are all the benefit of endurance during affliction, testing, and trials. So our our affliction has a purpose, and it's not to knock us down. Our affliction has a purpose to build us up. If we endure those things knowing God has a purpose in it, and we endure those things knowing it's for our own good. We'll have a complete different perspective on our affliction than just, oh, I'm in pain, wish I could die. We'll know that there's a purpose and there's a reward for that. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed. You ever felt completely overwhelmed? I have, many times. Beyond our strength. So that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, if we've got this mindset that pain is bad and I need to do everything I can to avoid pain and affliction and sickness and all that stuff, we're not leaving room for God to grow us and mature us 
into the image and conform us to the image of Christ. Whether it's physical, emotional, or both, we must still overcome. Uh, in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, I love this verse. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Our advocate, our representative in the courtroom of God has overcome the world. So whatever we go through is now a device for us to get that chip off our shoulder, to get conformed to the image of Christ so that we can be complete, mature, and lacking nothing. We now see that everything He does is for our own good. And everything that comes against us that the enemy is trying to do, He'll turn that also into good. If we love Him and are called according to His purpose, which is being conformed to the image of Christ. 1 John 5.4 Everyone who has born, been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. Remember what I said. We have to have faith to realize God's faithfulness to us in this world. That faith gives us the ability to conquer every thing that comes our way. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> faith has to be activated. And then always stay active in our trials, in our afflictions, so that faith comforts us with the hope that endurance will lead to the reward of maturity and God's provision in our lives. Does the Bible say that God always gives us what we want? No. It says He will meet our needs. What do we need the most? Physical comfort? No, what we need the most is spiritual conformity to the image of Christ. God knows that. So when He's meeting a need of ours, it is so that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. So sometimes we pray, Lord, take the pain away. Sometimes we pray, Lord, heal me now. And, and we've all done it. We all do it. I've done it. I'm still doing it. Lord, take the pain away. But sometimes He gives us something that we need to endure, and the comfort we get is not that the pain goes away. The comfort is it's I'm being conformed to the image of Christ. So, so from this day forward, I'm looking at it completely differently. I'm not looking for God to give me what I want. I'm looking to God to give me what I need spiritual maturity, and the provision that He gives, I take. Even if it doesn't look like what I want, I know that He has my best interest at heart. 1 Corinthians 1.7 And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so also you will share in the comfort. Remember, comfort and uh, suffering can coexist at the same time. Faith has the ability to make us unshakable. Or, or as Cheryl said, uh, last month, the word, she always asks the Lord for a word every month. Last month, her word was unwavering. Unshakable. They mean the same thing. That Lord, when, when the wind is coming against me, I won't bow. 
to the wind. I will stand firm in the faith that you're going to do something that will calm the storm. I'm unwavering, I'm unshakable in my faith that everything that comes at me, you're going to use it for my good. And the comfort isn't physical, but the comfort is, in the end, I will be better than I would be if he just took the pain away. He just took the suffering away. Last verse, 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh, ready, is finished with sin. That's the Bible. That's not me. That's not my opinion. That's the truth. The one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. That's the goal. That's the reward. If we keep that in our mind, the suffering becomes secondary because we know the purpose of our suffering is to bring us into maturity and to conform us to the image of Christ. Suffering for Christ is the end of sin's stronghold over us. I know in the world that does not make sense. But if you're in Christ, he said, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the way the world thinks. I have overcome the way the world does things. I have overcome the way the world wants to just pound us and and walk over us and beat us into the dirt. I have overcome the world so that when you endure, you can walk free from sin's stronghold. You can walk free from any affliction, whether it's still there or not. Amen? Amen. It's a different way to look at suffering. Now, if you would have said to me Tuesday morning when I, when I started reading in 2 Corinthians, if you had said to me, this, this will be a, an encouraging and uplifting sermon, I would have said to you, not only do I not think that, but I don't want to do that as a sermon. And the moment that I thought that, I went, that means I have to do it. Because this is an incredibly good message. I'm not saying I presented it good. I'm still human. I'm saying it's a, it is a good word. It is a good uh, um, message. It is God's message that in our endurance comes comfort. Knowing that no matter what the world, the flesh, or the devil throws at us, Jesus has overcome all three of those things. The world can't touch you if you take your place behind Jesus and let Him be your advocate. Doesn't mean the pain always goes away. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But the comfort comes in knowing that there's a greater purpose than my physical comfort. And that is that He's shaping me to become the image of of Christ. So that when I get to that point where I cross over from this life to the next, then there will be no suffering. So the healing may come in this life or it may not come until we pass from this life into eternity. Either way, it's a win. Either way, it's a victory. Either way, it's you overcoming the world because we are shaped and molded into the image of Christ. Bow your heads. Father, I I know that uh, there are several of us in this congregation that are going through things that we we just want to be rid of. We, we We want it to be taken away from us. But if we have the mind of Christ and if we continue to think 
the way Jesus thought, we will eventually come to an experience where we are in the garden and we say, Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thy will be done. Give us that mindset, Lord, that rather than getting out of all of our suffering, we realize that there's a purpose to it. We submit to that purpose because we know it will make us conform to the image of our advocate so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see the brokenness and the pain. He sees Jesus. And his ultimate purpose is to make us all into the image of Christ. Forgive us when we want things comfortable instead of wanting things holy and right. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Carol, come and lead us in a final song.